Hi, and thanks for joining us on a very spook-filled, candy-filled episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And we are going to be doing something we've never done for all the years we've been doing the show for Halloween, pairing Halloween candy with wine. And we did something similar a while back with the Girl Scout cookies. Not the same. It's an, it's an unusual pairing. It is. And this is a little off the normal beaten track for a wine drinker. It is. But it's going to be a lot of fun. It is. And, you know, it's funny because, Jim, you're like uh, me and my wife. We love Halloween. And we, I love decorating and giving out candy. And a lot of times for the last couple of years, I don't really drink anything during Halloween because I've never thought of candy and wine going together. And then you sent me that really interesting article about pairing Halloween candies that I actually like with wine. Right, and this, this came from Vivino, so I want to give them credit for publishing this list. But uh, Bob and I picked out some of our favorite candies and our favorite wines, and we're going to pair them together today and see how this works. And we got five to, to start off with. Right? And, uh, and we'll get, get you all ready at home to be drinking wine when you're handing out candy. For that's that right, one. and hopefully it'll be a nice, uh, good weather for Halloween this year, even though it falls on a Tuesday, I believe, this yeah. year. So that's not the greatest, but because uh, we have to work the next morning. So. I'll be having a glass of wine anyway. That's true. <laughs> So I, before we even get started, I, um, what are our candy choices here? I think we have, I'll well, start on my side. Start with your side, yeah. So I have Nerds, which are going to pair with Pinot Grigio. And I have a nice light Italian Pinot Grigio. Then we have Butterfingers, which are going to pair with um, the Cab or the Pinot Grigio. Uh, you brought, I think you brought those for the Cab. Yeah, I'm sorry. So the, yeah. the Butterfingers and Twix will pair with the Cab. And then we move right into what Jim's choices are. So I brought a, a Riesling today from Germany. And Riesling, just like with Thanksgiving, you know, we talked about the, the Riesling being such a versatile grape at Thanksgiving, a pairing with so many different foods on the Thanksgiving table, you know, the, and it cut through the cream sauces and the fatty meats. And for Halloween, it's the same thing. It's so versatile. It works with a lot of different candies. So I brought a couple as well. We're going to have uh, Starburst and Sour Patch Kids with the Riesling. Two of my favorites. We could also do Skittles. I didn't bring Skittles today, but Skittles also go well with a Riesling. Excellent. And then uh, I brought a German, or excuse me, an Austrian Zweigelt, which is a, it's a light style red wine, and we're going to pair that with a peanut butter cup. And I, I don't think we've even ever had that on the show we've before. We've never had a Zweigelt on the show before. They're very rare. Uh, I'll talk about, about that a little later. I even like the name, Zweigelt. Exactly. That's, that's yeah. a good name. That's a good <laughs> wine to have in a future show, so I'll have to remember that. So we have five wines, so I guess we'll start on the Pinot Grigio, because obviously that's the lighter of the two. So what I have is I prepare, Jim, a little shot of nerds. You're gonna eat all those nerds? Not all at the same time, because okay. that'll not be good on the camera. So I'm gonna pop a few. Well, I'm gonna try the wine first and see how it tastes by I'm itself. gonna do the opposite. And that's a typical Pinot Grigio, um, light style. Um, this has some body to it, which is kind of surprising me. It does. It's, a, it's an Italian Pinot Grigio. It's very light. It's moderately priced. I picked up a few of these the other day because they were doing a, a tasting. And I said, well, this is pretty good. This is going to go good on the show. So my nerds have now dissolved. So let's see how the wine tastes with it. And this has a little bite to it, too, which kind of surprised me. Usually you don't get that with a Pinot Grigio. Oh, yeah, that's good. Now, see, that's nice. As Jim sucks his candy, uh, what, you, what you find here is the Pinot Grigio is tempered perfectly with the nerds. You get that mm -hmm. little effervescence with the nerds, which I like, sort of like that little pop rocky flavor. Yep. And then you temper it really quick with a very light Pinot Grigio. And it's a, it's a light alcohol mm -hmm. Pinot Grigio, too. So, you know, you're up you're giving out candy and, uh, you know, you're not going to get hammered drinking a lot of that. But that's a really good combination. It really brings out the sourness of the nerds, too. It sure does, which I love. I love sour candy. I'm glad you brought those uh, sour patch kids in. So uh, that's a great, it's, it's, it's a great combination. Once again, it's one of those things that's affordable. I think this is under $10, $11 usually mm -hmm. in the store. It's available pretty much everywhere right now. Um, so it's a great mild Pinot Grigio that goes great with nerds. I'm not even going to call that a mild Pinot Grigio. I mean, for Pinot Grigios in general are mild, uh, but this one, because it's got that little citrus bite to it, I think it kind of jumps out uh, a little more than a, a yeah, you are Pinot right. Grigio. Um, which for my palate is preferable. I like a little acidity. I like a little bite. Uh, so if I'm going to drink a Pinot Grigio, I'm going to look for this one. Yeah, it's, it's really good. And what's great about this one also is like most Italian Pinot Grigios, in general, they're easy to drink. Yeah. Um, whether it's pairing with candy or in general. Um, but that's a great combination. Yeah, um, Pinot Grigios are, are a great everyday wine just because, you know, they don't clash with a lot of stuff. Um, oftentimes, they don't have a whole lot of flavor. Um, but that's, that's one of the reasons people seek them out is because they don't want to offend the palate by having some kind of harsh characteristic. Yes, offend with costumes and scariness <laughs> on Halloween, not with the wine. So that's perfect. 
All right, so that's a good combination. All right, so we're on now to the German Riesling. Oh, boy. And there's a little bit of a story behind this. And full disclosure here, this is a wine that I sell in the Massachusetts area. My company represents this. Uh, this is called Moseland Cat Riesling. And it's actually imported by a guy named Brett Halby from Halby Marketing. He brings it into the United States. He sells it to our company in Massachusetts. Uh, and I had the pleasure of going out on the road with him a couple of weeks ago and, and taking him around for three days to see some of my clients. And he told me all about the wines. He told me the history of the wine. Uh, but he also told me that the wine is available here in Connecticut. If you're looking for this, um, he sells it to a distributor called Apici. And if that sounds familiar to you, that's because Veronica Sauret, who has been a guest on our show yes, a couple of times. Yes, 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 yes. She worked for Apici the first time she was our guest. And then she moved on to Breskin Barton after that. Uh, but it went, yeah, as soon as he mentioned Opeche, I knew exactly who that was. And this Riesling is always bottled this way? This, this is available in a cat-shaped bottle. Uh, we got black and orange for the Halloween holiday. Uh, they make other colors. They do a, a green and a red for Christmas. They do silver and gold that you can get for New Year's Eve. They can do uh, red, white, and blue for, for uh, July 4th. And they also do a pink one, uh, and part of the proceeds for the pink bottle go to support breast cancer research. And it's so not just a kitschy bottle, it's actually pretty good. It's, it's, a, it's a great everyday Riesling. Um, and there's a story behind it, and this, the, the whole reason there's a cat-shaped bottle, uh, Brett was telling me the story that, uh, as, according to legend, three wine merchants went into the town of Zell in Germany looking to buy some Riesling. And then, you know, Zell is in the Mosul area, and that's, they make great Rieslings there. So the merchants went in looking to buy a Riesling, and they were uh, approaching a large wine cask to take a sample, and a black cat jumps up on it, arches his back, and starts swiping at everybody who came by. And the merchant said, well, if the cat's got to be guarding the best wine in the That's, lot, so yeah. let's buy that cask right there. That's phenomenal. It's a great story. And they've been selling the Riesling ever since, and then made the uh, cat-shaped bottle as an homage to the black cat. And what's going to be uh, paired with that one? So this one, you can do a couple of different things. You can try the Starburst. Uh, you can try the Sour Patch Kid. I'm going to go with a Sour Patch. I'm going to do the same way I did last okay, time. Okay, you try the candy first. I'm going to taste the wine. And what I love about this, it's a great, what I call, middle-of-the-road Riesling. It's not too sweet. It's not too acidic. Uh, some people, especially here in America, are really afraid of Rieslings being overly sweet or syrupy. You don't get that with this Riesling. It's, it's got uh, you know, a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of acidity. But if you remember, you know, as the Riesling grape is the most acidic grape in the wine world. And to balance out all that acidity, the winemakers leave in a lot of residual sugar. And sometimes they leave in more sugar and you get something super syrupy. And sometimes they, they let the acidity show off and you get something with a lot of bite to it. Yeah. Here they balanced it out perfectly. It is a good balance. And you, know, you would think with the sugar that's coating the, the Sour Patch Kid that would add to the sugar content of the Riesling and make it more syrupy, but it doesn't at all. Actually, it's a good balance. It's, it's a good mixture of both the Riesling, and it is a very nice Riesling. It's not certain syrupy mm. at all. And just like with our first pairing, the acidity uh, and the sourness of the Sour Patch Kid really jumps out when you have the wine. You know, you get the candy normally, and there's that sour component to it, that bite to it. You pair it with the wine, and it just explodes. It does. It, just, it magnifies it. It's funny because it makes, it makes a relatively accessible wine actually seem even better because of the explosion of sort of what it does yeah. inside your palate. It's like, wow, I'm, I, this is really exciting what's going on. A really good combination. I was, I was expecting some clashes today, but so far these, these have kind of just amplified everything we've been eating. It's, yeah, it, it, you know, what's interesting is generally you're going to be eating candy on Halloween or whenever you're going to do something like this. You're really just throwing candy in your mouth by the globs sometimes. You're not eating it one little piece at a time. I think if you put like two or three in your mouth, and we're not going to do that on the camera because it just makes too much noise, that would even be more of a, yeah. a, a big shock yeah. to the palate. If you were chewing two Sour Patches or you chugged a thing of Nerds, yeah. um, I think it would even be more pronounced in regards to how good it is yeah. as a flavor profile. But I was really expecting some kind of bad pairing like, like beer and donuts. You know, they're just, they don't go together, and if you eat them together, it's, it's well, we still got three more experience. bottles. We, we still might we have do, a well, <laughs> well, this is the same wine. The, the black cat and the orange cat are the, it's a Riesling. Oh, they just it's offer a, different colors. Yeah, they do different colors. Uh, I've been pouring a lot of these the last couple of weeks, so I got a lot of empty bottles. So that's why I thought they'd make great props on the show. They do make great props. They look great. Well, i got to say, I'm very surprised with our first two selections, especially since we've never done a tasting quite like this one before. And I know I'll be uh, including these varietals on my Halloween Tuesday night, I believe. So, yeah. thumbs and, up. And then, you know, it makes a great decoration after you empty the bottle. 
It is, and you, I, what was the price point of these? Uh, this is in the fourteen to eighteen dollar range, depending on where you buy it. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's up in Massachusetts. Uh, here, in Ma here in Connecticut, they've got state minimum pricing, and I'm not sure what it's selling for here. Um, it's probably in the same range. Yeah. But people hold on to these after they they empty the bottle. You know, they they turn them into lamps, or they can use them as candle holders. They, you know, it's such a great looking bottle. They like holding on to it for a while. Yeah, like I said, I, and this is an actual German Riesling. There's no. Yes, this is from Zell, from the the Mosel area, and it's called Moseland Cat Riesling. Well, it got my meow going. Yeah. <laughs> so. Now, just uh, uh, another note about this: this is a 500 milliliter bottle, so it's two thirds of the volume you'd get from a regular wine bottle. You know, normally, you're getting 750 milliliters. Now that's interesting because how would they market that? Do the people just have to know just by looking at it that it's smaller? Do they have to tell you when you're buying it that it's on a smaller? Well, it's size? it's on the bottle. It's the, so the, you do have to yeah, look. Yeah. Because people automatically assume it's yeah. going to be the same volume as a standard bottle. Of right. Wine. And yeah. This thing. People buy it for me, and and it empties out a little faster, and so. That's I important. Because <laughs> people know what they get usually in a bottle yeah. of wine, how many pours yeah. they can get. Yeah. So you might have to buy two or three of those too. That's what I always tell them. That's <laughs> nothing wrong with that. All right. So. Great. What's All our right. next choice going on? Next up, we have a Zweigelt. This is the first time we've had one on the show. Uh, Zweig Zweigelt is a grape varietal that was created in 1922 by an Austrian scientist named Fritz Zweigelt. And he crossed two other Austrian grapes called Blaufunkisch Blau Blau and Saint Laurent and created this light style red wine. Uh, it's, it's similar to a Grenache or a Cote de Rhone. So light style, um, got a lot of fruit though, a lot of body, to, uh, not a lot of body, but a, a lot of fruit characteristics. Um, Very mild color. It's, you know, it's not, it's not going to be as dark as the cab that we're going to try next, but you get some, some great uh, cherry with this and some blackberry. And this is going to go with? Um... This is going to go with the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Oh, that's good. So you could do. I'm going to do mine first. You could also pair uh, Pinot Noir with the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Um, or you could look for a, an Austrian Saint Laurent, but those are very rare. You know, when you look at how much wine gets produced around the world, and, and then you look at the quantity of Zweigelt and Saint Laurent that gets produced, it's it's minuscule, and and because there's so little of it, even less of it ends up here in the United States. So they can be difficult to find. Uh, I bought this bottle at Whole Food in Boston, but I also looked online before coming down here. You can get a Zweigelt at Total Wine. They had two or three on their website. Um, and Maximum Beverage also had a Zweigelt on their website. So you can, if you're looking for a Zweigelt, you want something different to show off to your friends, uh, you can get that here in West Hartford. Well, as I recovered from my climactic experience, I gotta say that is absolutely fantastic with the peanut butter cup and the Zweigelt. Mm. I love it, it's absolutely delicious. Well, this is my favorite Halloween candy. I love Reese's peanut butter cups. I never would have guessed a peanut butter type chocolate, because we've done pairings of chocolate before. Mm -hmm. We've done a chocolate show. Um, but the peanut butter and chocolate, which everybody loves mostly, unless you're allergic to peanuts, just really smooths out mm -hmm. and just, it's an absolutely, just coats the inside of your mouth. It's fantastic. I get some kind of silky sensation in my mouth uh, and the, the sugary finish just kind of stretches out a lot longer with the wine. Now is this it's, in general um, a more expensive wine? No, this uh, this again. This was uh, fifteen to twenty dollars, so wow. it's it's not that outrageous. I'm just really surprised just how good <clears throat> the peanut butter cup goes yeah. with this particular red. Really, really good. Matter of fact, I'm gonna take another bite. <laughs> yeah, I was I was tempted to just bring a Pinot Noir, and we've had so many Pinot Noirs yeah. on the show. I thought, you know, let's let's stretch a little and, and do a different grape varietal. And I'm I'm glad I did because this is just a phenomenal bottle. And we've talked about this so many times all the years we've been doing the show, how sometimes food can change the characteristic of a wine, how sometimes depending on what you're eating could have a, a good experience or a positive experience. Mm -hmm. This is an example of candy, which everybody loves, actually being a great companion to some really halfway good wine. Well, halfway good, very good wine. Yeah. So I'm really surprised by that. I, I'm actually curious, before we even go to the, the cab, maybe trying one of my selections with this red, it was, sure. just, it was yeah. I just think it might go well too because, for instance, the Twix or the Butterfinger has the buttery aspect okay. of it. Okay, yeah, give it a shot. So I'm going to try a little bite of a Butterfinger. And I'll try a Twix. And we'll just see how this pairs. Now, this is not 
part of the tasting notes we got when we did show prep. So we're going off script. We are. Jim hates when I do that. <laughs> we're doing it in the name of science, though. It's different. Not quite as good as a peanut butter cup. It's, it's similar, but not quite. It's still good, but not quite as good. Yeah. So this is, this is that clash that I was starting to think about. We we're going to get the whole night. They don't quite meet up the way they should. And you don't uh, want anything fighting in your mouth. No. Not that it's a bad experience. It's, it's not really harsh, but it, it, compared to the first three selections we had, now, this just isn't working that well. Yeah, and, and the best way to explain it, because obviously you're watching it on TV, you're not really you know, tasting with us, unless you are tasting with us. It, bread and butter go together, just like the first few pairings we had. Mm -hmm. It's a good mix. Everything seems to be tasting right in your mouth. This one's just a little off, sort of like putting um, sour cream on a piece of toast. or Yeah, maybe sour cream because you get a little bit of sourness. Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't quite taste the way it should. So that's good. I'm glad I did that right now, just so we know that there could be a bad pairing. Let's go ahead and go back. Too. And, and this way, you at home, when you're watching, won't go off script either. Just stick to the pairings that we've told you about or the, the ones that Vivino have listed on their website. There's a reason and that we, they put them up. And there is, yeah. They, they had experts <laughs> doing this. <laughs> yeah, so they, they've had people who spent the whole day doing exactly what yeah. we're doing and uh, you know, listen to the experts. That's a tough job. It's a very Sitting tough job. in a room, drinking wine and eating candy. <laughs> so the next one is uh, my Spanish cab which I recently bought a few of these, uh, oh, probably end of the summer, because it was a nice light cab, inexpensive, I think under $9 for the bottle. And I saved a couple for this particular show, mm -hmm. knowing that this might go very well. And then Jim sent me the, the vino text, and even though I thought I was going to be tasting it with just regular stuff, I said, well, mm -hmm. I have a good cab to use for the candy. So this one's going to pair with the um, Twix or the Butterfinger. Okay. So I'm going to try the Twix this time. And I'll go with the Butterfinger this time. This reminds me of Spain. This, if, you, if I was tasting this blind and you said it was Spanish, I would, have, I, right I would guess it's a Tempranillo. It's, it's, got, um, it's a departure from that California style. You know, the California's got a lot of fruit. A lot uh, of berry. Lot of, yeah. And you get, uh, you get a little more old world taste with this you get uh, a little earthiness with this not a whole lot of tannin but it's not showing a lot of fruit either it's not so i'm curious to see how this goes with the chocolate it is i, I thought the, the pairing was good uh, not as rich and smooth and silky as some of our earlier ones but it's certainly a, a combination that works and i think this also goes with the butterfinger mm -hmm. which i'm going to try having right now and it, it works with the butterfinger um, again, it's not, it's not that big fruity experience and it's, I'm not getting a lot of sweetness from this either. It worked better with the Butterfinger than it did the Twix to me. Yeah, it definitely worked better. At least my palate says, if you're going to have the El, El Torito, mm -hmm. um, and my, for my palate says the Butterfinger goes really well with this particular wine. And you found the opposite. It works with both. I'm not. I'm not saying it doesn't. But I this. I think of the four wines that we've tasted tonight. This is the least compatible with with the candy pairing. Interesting. Actually, it should also compare. It should pair with the peanut butter cup, shouldn't it? Uh, I think. I know it's not category, one of them. But let's try it. Try it. Give it a shot. I'll, I'll, pour yeah, you a little I'll more. need a little more. <clears throat> That's good. Thank you. Was there anything with Snickers? I can't remember what we mm -hmm. with Snickers. We couldn't bring everything on the show. We yeah, they, uh, I think it was a Zinfandel. It was a Zinfandel. And I, I brought some Swedish fish today, um, just on the off chance that I was going to pick up a Lambrusco before doing the show. Because that's, that's another supposedly great pairing, is Swedish fish and Italian Lambrusco. It goes. I think they both go just as well, to be perfectly honest okay. with you. I really do. I think they both go pretty well. And it, it, depending on what you like for candy, um, some people like the sweet, some people like the chocolatey. I particularly like all the types of candy. So you can do something similar to this, what we're doing here, anytime, up to Halloween or even after Halloween, and uh, probably have the same interesting experience. And again, everyone's palate is different. So if, you know, if you're going to try some of these pairings we're doing tonight, maybe they don't agree with your palate. Uh, try something else. There were, there were uh, I think, 12 or 15 different candies you could pair up with wines, and so there's plenty out there for you to experiment with. 
So what are you up to now for how leading up to Halloween yourself? Do you have a lot more um, uh, wine shows going on? Oh yeah, I've got a lot of lot of uh, wine tastings. I'm doing uh, I'm doing some private tastings. There uh, there are a couple of high rise buildings in Boston that uh, I'm doing private tastings for their residents. Oh no kidding! It's uh, it's more of a marketing push for us, but. Are they pushing anything for the holidays this year? Well, this, you know, the, the cat-shaped bottles are really big this time of year, uh, especially up in Salem. You know, the, Salem's a big tourist area uh, just, just north of Boston, and anything cat-related just sells up there. You know, and it's funny because I know we've talked about this before. Mm-hmm. Even though it's a, a, a shaped bottle, it's good wine. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's, I like to say it's a great introductory Riesling for people who've never had Riesling before, uh, or if you're afraid of Riesling. You think it's going to be too sugary. This is a good Riesling to try because it's not very sweet. And what were the three categories of Riesling? I think there were three different varietals. Well, there's, yeah, they have sweetness levels. Um, and my German's not that good, but the, you know, Trocken is one that oh, we that's see right. all yeah. the time. And the, uh, I think it's Auschwitz. Ausch... I'm going to have to study up on that. We'll do, a, you know what, we'll do a Riesling show. I'll have all the notes for it. There were three varietals. But so. there's, well, there's, there's three, three or four sweetness levels. But it's all, it's all the same grape. It's all Riesling. And it's just how much residual sugar they leave in the wine. And for sugar content, and my science is a little off today, the higher sugar content wine will be the reds, correct, compared to the the, Zimp, uh, the Pinot Grigio and the Riesling? Well, I th- no, I think the, the wine on the table today that's got the highest sugar content, highest residual sugar, is going to be the Riesling. It would be the Riesling. Yeah. Even though it's a, to my, yeah. my palate, is a drier Riesling, yeah. there's still more sugar in yeah. that. And the alcohol content on a Riesling generally is, well, actually, it's only 10.5. Yeah. So that's actually it's pretty low. good. It it's is low. low. Yeah, most wines are 12. It's actually lower than the uh, Pinot Grigio. So that kind of is surprising to me, too, because I thought Rieslings were a little bit higher in alcohol. Is it in generally just because it's this varietal, or in general it's about that? No, it's, uh, I think you're thinking of uh, Red Zinfandel. Red Zinfandels are higher in alcohol. Those get up to 15, 16, 17 percent. Yeah, and actually, I don't remember what paired with uh, a Red Zinfandel. Um, I know you said Snickers, but was that I, I only might have else? Been, No, there was a couple others. Because that's a pretty... Should, you know, we should have brought the shard in. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a good idea. Now, I'm going to go back to this Pinot Grigio again. All right. Because it's still very cold. And we want to emphasize, I think, everything should be cold when it comes to yeah. the reason. Oh, and, and the, uh, the Zweigelt as well. You want to serve that with just a slight chill. I, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a couple of reds out there that needed just a little bit of a chill, and this is one of them. Well, you know, I meant to tell you, because I haven't seen you in a while, that uh, there's a lot of controversy, and our bubble show is coming up soon. A lot of the experts now are wanting to steer away from flutes for champagne or bubbles. I've, I've been reading that, too. Yeah. And it's getting to be pretty heated discussion in regards to the camps, whether the flutes or what do they call the... Uh, the, the kind of bowl, the cup-shaped. The cup-shaped. Yeah. And most, I don't want to say wine snobs, but one camp is going to say that if you want the true flavor of the champagne or bubbles, Mm -hmm. you're not getting that with a flute. Right. You're getting all the bubbles. I agree. But, you know, I like the bubbles and effervescence. Yeah. So I think that's another, maybe we can squeeze that in on the bubble show. Have have, maybe a flute. I have some old school cup-shaped glasses I'll bring in. And they say that the flavor is pretty pronouncedly different when you take a sip out of both. You know, it's going to be like that, that Riedel show we did. Where we had a regular wine glass and the Riedel glass and tasted the same wine side by side. And I think and it's across the board, both for Champagne, Cava, yeah. and Prosecco. Yeah. Even the lower cost stuff, they say, don't get the bubbles, open it up in the glass. Yeah. Yeah. So, but in my opinion, if you do that, it's sort of like drinking a Vino Verde. You know, you're losing too many of the uh, effervescence. Uh, yeah, I, I can see that. But again, it's, you know, what are, you, what are you drinking the Champagne for? Are you drinking it for the bubbles or are you drinking it for the flavor? <sighs> You know, I'm glad you asked that question because for wine, to me, I look forward to the bubbles and the effervescence when I have a glass of champagne, cava, prosecco. I look forward to that. I like seeing the head on it. I like It goes back to probably my beer days when I used to like beer. I mm-hmm. like a nice big head on it. And uh, I just sort of like how it looks. It looks sparkly. I think you just end up looking like a wine in the, uh, the old style glasses. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I don't know if that's what I want. So. Well, it's, you know, the whole reason you're drinking champagne is for a different kind of experience. You want the bubbles. You want something a little more elegant. You want to feel like you're being a little more sophisticated. Actually, the, la- the last time you're on the show, sorry, sorry, Jim, the last time you're on the show, are there any bubbles, proseccos, or cavas that 
you've recently tasted that I haven't tasted up there in Boston that's sort of really blown you away? I, I brought a bottle. I'm going to give it to you Saturday night. So and maybe we'll put it on our next show. But It's, um, it's a Prosecco. It is. Yeah. <laughs> and you had it but I don't want to let the cat out of the bag. No, no, no. Here. I know. We got I'm, enough cats on the table right now. <laughs> we're teasing the, the viewers here, but I'll be bringing some more bubbles for you. Yeah. Fantastic. So I think out of my favorite pairing, and our, we've got a few minutes left here. My favorite pairing, I think, is going to be the Riesling and the Pinot Grigio, because uh, Nerds and Sour Patch Kids are up there with my favorite candies. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's my. Well, favorite. I was gonna suggest. Go back and try the Riesling again with the Starburst, because you didn't do that yet. I did not. And I just had one. And it's, again, it's a great pairing. This, you know, this works so well with the Sour Patch Kids. It works well with the Starburst. You get that, that extra explosion from the candy that you don't get when you just eat the candy by itself. It just amplifies the whole experience. And you still have the, the Riesling? Are you... You're, you're drinking the Pinot Grigio right now. No, I just poured myself oh, some of the Riesling. Yeah. All right. And I just had a little nibble of uh, the sour, uh, Starburst. Oh, damn, that is good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so our remaining few moments of the show, Jim, I think this is, in my opinion, been very successful. And it's a great way to clean up after Halloween. You know, the kids take most of the candy, but there's always something left over. Oh. You know, if you're trying to get rid of it, and, even, and let's say you're the kind of person who goes out and buys bulk, and you've got a couple extra bags. Which everybody have, should have bulk. Have some friends over, Afterwards. buy a couple of bottles of wine, and, and do your own little pairing party like this. Yeah, we don't have kids, so we pretty much party anytime we want. <laughs> but I think it's a great idea. If you, if you have kids, you have a big family, let the kids have that day, and then save the, the candy tasting party for the weekend That's or for the day That's a great after. idea. So Halloween's on a Tuesday this year. Wait till Friday or Saturday. Wait till Friday, because you're going to have candy left yeah. over. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Because it, it has been for me, and it's been very informative. So, Jim, as always, I want to thank you for coming down from Boston. I know it's... Uh, you are so busy up there now, being the wine connoisseur. <laughs> I'm waiting to, for you to become a sommelier up there. So uh, One of these days. <laughs> One of these days it'll happen. But, uh, you know, the holidays are around the, around the corner. I think we have our seventh bubble show coming up. Yeah. Which is astounding. Yep. Seven years, going on over seven years almost, of uh, doing this show. And we want to thank everybody, of course, for all the years of watching and making our show so successful. And uh, Jim's a good part of that because he adds the technical know-how and whimsical analogies of the wine, and I'm the Regis Philbin character. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Jim, thanks for coming down. Thank you, Bob. My pleasure. As and uh, happy Halloween to everybody. We look forward to seeing everybody on our bubble show. So thanks for watching. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And until next time, keep both of us in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.